Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Lily Chang, speaking to you from San Diego. I chair the San Diego Chinese Historical Museum Board. Also, I'm the founding director of the San Diego Chinese, uh, San Diego State University Chinese Cultural Center. We are so happy today to welcome Anne Hoiberg to speak about women of the gas lamp quarter and Chinatown. And today I'm also honored to introduce our moderator for this morning's presentation, Dr. Bob Stein. Dr. Bob Stein serves as the medical director of the Palama Rehabilitation Hospital. He also serves as the chair of the San Diego chapter of American Heart Association. Dr. Bob Stein, please take it over. Thank you so much. Um, thank you very much, Lily, for your usually uh, uh, effusive uh, introduction. And uh, I have uh, some exciting news as well. Uh, but today we're going to be hearing Women of the Gas Lamp Quarter and San Diego Chinatown by Anne Hoiberg. And I am actually can't wait to hear this. But if we can have the next slide, uh, I want to mention upcoming events. Uh, April 15th, we're going to be having a talk on decoding Chinese opera by John Wai Kung Lo. And I can't wait because I'm going to learn a lot about Chinese opera and those masks. And, uh, it's going to be just a lot of fun. You're just not going to want to miss it. Uh, and then the following month in May, uh, we're, on, we're going to have each one is on the third Saturday. Um, uh, on May, we're going to have a talk on Chinese laundries here in San Diego, uh, their origins, their history, where we are today by John Lee Wong, who has a personal interest in this. Uh, at this point, I want to turn things over to uh, Yu Dan Wang, who is going to talk about uh, uh, Oh, uh, who's going to be uh, talking about uh, uh, Chinese uh, Cultural Center upcoming events? But before I do, I want to uh, I want to announce the uh, executive director uh, for the San Diego Chinese Historical Museum. Uh, a wonderful appointment. It's Hacinta Wang, and she's going to be starting in mid-April. And so uh, Hacinta comes to us from uh, Chicago. She's moved here. Um, uh, in recent years, and she's worked for decades in management experience for the city of Chicago, working in a variety of programs uh, in ethics and buildings and the like. And she's had a long-standing interest in the Chinese community in Chicago. And uh, uh, she uh, has been a member of the Chinese American Service League of Chicago as a volunteer since 1990 and was a board member for a number of years as well. And uh, we're just all looking forward to having her come. And so my title of interim director will disappear as soon as she starts, which I'm looking forward to. Uh, and Hacinta, would you like to uh, have a couple words? You can unmute yourself. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm 
really excited to join in on this uh, lecture series today. Um, I haven't officially started, but I'm already trying to jump in and learn everything that the museum is offering. And so I'm super excited to hear, um, this is actually a very interesting topic to me, especially being Women's History Month and you know, learning about the gas lamp quarter. Um, Bob has given me a little bit more credit than I deserve. I haven't been in San Diego for years. I've only been here for seven months. So, um, but I'm super excited to you know, learn about the museum and hopefully meet everybody at some point. Uh, and see, you know, where everybody is coming from. I think this opportunity to do these lecture series via Zoom and seeing all of the different places that everyone is logging in from is super exciting. So um, I'm grateful to have the opportunity to be here. Thanks so much. Okay. Well, uh, thank you again, Jacinta. And again, we're all going to be looking forward to working with you. Uh, this is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, if I may see the next slide, this. Uh, presentation is being brought to us by the PLUS Charitable Trust and the S. Sue family. Uh, and uh, at this time, we're going to turn things over to uh, you, Don. I got things out of order because of uh, Jacinta's introduction, uh, but we're now back to uh, you, Don, talking about upcoming events at San Diego State's Chinese Cultural Center. So you, Don? Thank you, Dr. Bob. Uh, my name is Yudan Wang from the Chinese Culture Center at San Diego State University. I'm earlier, I'm sure. thrilled to announce a new cultural program at our center. It's on um, April 4th uh, at 1 uh, in the afternoon, and the location is on campus in the culture, uh, culture center. It's a program about one stop drawing workshop. And we're gonna have a, an art experience of the Chinese traditional drawing with the brush and ink. Uh, for sign up, please log in the, our website, education2.sdsu.edu slash ccc. Uh, thank you. Now I'm gonna turn over to the next slide for uh, Elizabeth. Good morning, everyone. Most of you who have joined us, joined, joined us at past programs probably have heard the guidelines that we provide beforehand, but it never hurts to provide a reminder. So after today's presentations, we will have a Q&A session. If you have a comment or a question, you may raise your Zoom hand or write in the chat box, and we'll call on you when it's your turn. Before today's program starts, we're going to take a group picture and we'll ask that everyone please turn their camera on just before the beginning of the lecture. After we take the group photo, we're going to ask that everyone turns their microphones and their cameras off so that we have a better experience today at our program. With that, I'm gonna ask you, Don, if we could, could go to the the gallery screen um, where we can see everybody um, and take group photos. So we'll start with the first one. Uh, so we'll start one, two. Hello, Lily. Hello, Lily. Hello, Lily. Hello, Lily. Great. Give me a moment. I'm going to save that one and go to a new one. Okay, so let's see, we've got, oh, here we have four screens. So the next one. One, two, three. Beautiful. Save that one. And now the third screen. Not as many people have the cameras on the third screen. It's so good to keep it right. One, two, three. Great. I'm going to go to the fourth screen and then we're done. So, okay. One, two, three. Beautiful. We're good as far as screenshots go. You know, if you'd like to put the slides back. Awesome. Okay. If we could have the next slide.
Um, okay, so we're, uh, I'm gonna introduce now, it's my pleasure to introduce Anne Hoiberg, who's retired from a career as a psych research psychologist focusing on women's health issues, a very uh, topical uh, area in view of uh, the health equity issue uh, in America. Uh, and she's also president of the International Museum of Human Rights in San Diego, the Bilateral Safety Corridor Coalition, the La Jolla Pan Women. And we're going to have as a discussant, none other than Lily Cheng, our own chairperson of the San Diego Chinese uh, Historical uh, Museum's Board of Directors, who herself is a professor emeritus in the School of Speech, Language and Hearing at San Diego State and founder of the Chinese Cultural Center at San Diego State. Uh, and I just wanna mention uh, the captions underneath, which I do not see right now. And, uh, and there they are. Uh, and so uh, we should be seeing uh, captions uh, during the talk. And uh, if we do, uh, they are uh, transmitting English speaking voice into Chinese characters. And my Chinese speaking friends tell me that it's highly accurate unless a person attempts to say something in Chinese, an English speaker attempting to say something in Chinese, which completely befuddles the software. But beyond that, it's accurate. And then uh, lastly, I want to remind everybody to mute yourself. Uh, and also uh, at the end, we will take questions from the chats and also hand raising. When we're all finished, we're, we're going to have uh, Lily uh, be a discussant, and then we'll take all questions from the audience. So at this point, uh, the San Diego State uh, Chinese Cultural Center and the San Diego Chinese Historical Museum is proud to uh, have Anne Hoiberg uh, talk to us about Women of the Gasland Quarter. Anne, take it away. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Bob. And it's a pleasure for me to be here and talk about the most exciting area in San Diego, the Asian Pacific Thematic Historic District and the Gas Lamp Quarter. So today we're going to be talking about not only the wonderful women of this district, but we're also going to highlight many of the 93 historic buildings. Now these buildings hold the stories of the women who lived in the district. And let's put up the next slide. So today, this restored area of 93 historic buildings holds the stories of the women who lived in the district, those who helped others living in this area, women who tried to clean up the area, and those who enriched and preserved the district. The following stories belong to those women who left their mark on this area of architectural jewels. Next slide. So we're going to start by talking about Old Town. Now this particular area of San Diego and of California was inhabited by the Kumeyaay people for tens of thousands of years. Now Old Town, which has been the center of San Diego dating back to the 1840s, consisted of about 998 inhabitants, and that included Mexicans, it included uh, Native Americans, and about 200 settlers. Now, this particular area uh, was challenged. Uh, first of all, there was a desire to move the center of San Diego down to San Diego Bay and not to have it be located near Mission Valley or near the Presidio Ford. So the first attempt was in 1850, after California received its statehood. And the second attempt was in 1888. So let's have the next slide. 
So this shows a little bit of the activity as San Diego expanded a little bit from that 798 population of early San Diego. Okay, next slide. Now, Chinese immigrants came to San Diego primarily through San Francisco's Chinatown. And thousands of Chinese came. They came to avoid the problems in China. There was a huge famine and they came here to mine for gold during the 1840s. Then in 1863 to 1869, they were employed to work on the Transcontinental Railroad. Now they also came to San Diego, next slide but they were restricted to stay in a certain part of San Diego. And this included an eight block area of San Diego's Chinatown. And that also included some of the stingery and part of the gas lamp quarter area. Next slide. Now the Chinese workers who came to San Diego primarily started as fishermen and they provided San Diego's uh, population with abalone and all types of fish. But when the railroad was to be extended from National City to San Bernardino, more workers were needed, so 800 Chinese workers were brought to this area to work on that railroad from National City to San Bernardino. Next. Now we're standing at the beginning of Chinatown and there are two beautiful six foot high welcoming lions to this area. And this particular area is right next to the San Diego Chinese Historical Museum. Next slide. And as we can see, this beautiful building has been here at this location since the 1980s. So next slide. Now this particular building was actually the Chinese Museum mission school and this particular building was built in 1927 on land owned by George Marston and it also included an 18 room dormitory so many of the Chinese immigrants who were studying at the mission school had a place to stay now this particular school the Chinese mission school was headed by Martha, I'm sorry, Margaret Fanton. And she became known as a mother of Chinatown. And she went into the hovels and the shacks of Chinatown to see how the inhabitants were doing. And she also taught Sunday school and she taught English classes and helped these Chinese immigrants become more acclimated to San Diego. In 1925, she went to China and she brought news to the people living there from their relatives who lived back in San Diego's Chinatown. And when she returned, she resumed her work as the unofficial social worker of Chinatown. And this was before uh, social work became a profession. And she was the first here in San Diego's Chinatown. Now she did raise money to create this Chinese museum school. And she did retire uh, in 1935, but she did continue to help the Chinese immigrants with their particular endeavors. Next slide. Now, during the renovation of this area back in the 1970s and 1980s, there was considerable concern about the demolition of many of these Chinese historic buildings. 
in particular, the Chinese Mission School. And Dorothy Hom and Sally Wong Avery really took on this cause along with Dorothy's husband, Tom Hom. And they were determined to save as many of these historic buildings as they could, and primarily the Chinese Mission School. And they were able to save it. They jacked up this building onto a flatbed and brought it to 404 uh, 3rd Avenue, where it became the San Diego Chinese Historical Museum. So we have Dorothy Hom, Tom Hom, and Sally Wong Avery to thank for their efforts in saving this particular building from demolition. And they also saved almost 20 buildings during that demolition period. Next slide. Now, next to the uh, San Diego Historical, Chinese Historical Museum is a beautiful gate, the Dr. Sun Yet Sun Gate, which uh, leads to the most welcoming park in this area. And across the street is an addition to the San Diego Chinese Historical Museum, and that's the Dr. Sun Yet Sen addition to the museum and it has three galleries there and welcoming us to this beautiful, beautiful building is the first emperor of China. And currently there's an amazing exhibit on the history of acupuncture. Next slide. Now, as you can see here, we do have an, another photo of the Chinese Historical Museum where the tour begins of this area. Next slide. Now, as I mentioned, Sally Wong Avery was instrumental in working in this area, preserving buildings, enriching the whole area, but she became very involved in the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association, and she headed up the service center there for many years. She also received her JD from California, I'm sorry, Law Center, Cal Western. Cal Western, I'm sorry, and uh, also served in that capacity. Her foundation recently donated $10 million to UC San Diego, and she has formed a very special uh, library that will concentrate on Chinese artifacts and the history of China as far as San Diego goes. Next slide. The head of the um, San Diego Chinese Historical Museum Board of Directors is Dr. Lily Chang. And she uh, came to San Diego and completed her PhD work and started teaching. She founded um, several particular organizations and worked very hard at, um, at really promoting the museum. She also is um, the founder of the Chinese Cultural Center at San Diego State University. And that is the most gorgeous uh, part of San Diego State University campus. She presided as chair of the International Affairs Board of Directors of the, for the city of San Diego and chair of the Asian Pacific Thematic Historic District also for the city of San Diego. She grew up in Shanghai and um, I'm sorry, she grew up in Taiwan after being born in Shanghai. She entered graduate school in the United States in 1969 and began teaching after graduating. So under her leadership, the museum provides exhibitions and ongoing educational programs to share this rich Chinese cultural heritage with San Diego's diverse communities. Next slide. 
Now, next door to the museum is the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association, or CCBA. And back in 1911, it was sort of a, a spot for a radical group that was really working to create a revolution in China. And apparently, they were quite successful. And in 1912, it was taken over by the Chinese Cultural, I mean, Consolidated Benevolent Association to provide social services for Chinese immigrants. Now, this particular building also hosts the Lunar New Year every year right outside on the street uh, to celebrate this very special event for the community. Next slide. By the way, Sally Wong Avery was the first woman president of the CCBA. Now, Cindy uh, Quinn Su uh, is a great granddaughter of Ah Quinn and Sue Quinn, who are the mother and father of San Diego's Chinatown. Now, she grew up uh, being really curious about her ancestors. As I said, she is a great granddaughter of Ah Quinn and Sue Quinn and has dedicated her life to working on this particular issue. Her father actually helped restore one of the buildings back in the 1940s. Now she uh, has been also a, a, an analyst for the federal government and she worked in that capacity for 38 years. Next slide. Now the Quinn Produce Building is across the street from the museum. And this was where Ah Quinn uh, sold many of his uh, products that he grew on various lands that he either leased or owned somehow, even though Chinese were not allowed to own land. But this was the produce building from which many of the products were sold. And it was brought to this particular area on a flatbed brought by four horses and put up here at 431 3rd Avenue. It's been here and owned by the Quinn family ever since. Okay, next slide. As I said, Ah Quinn was quite the promoter. He owned a real estate. I'm not sure how he managed to do that, probably through his children who were natural born citizens of this country. And he also um, was very interested in developing various pieces of real estate. Next slide. Now his wife, Asu Leong Quinn came to the United States in 1878 when she was 16 years old. She worked for four months uh, in a private home. She was pretty much enslaved and she was finally rescued and brought to the Presbyterian home that was led by Superintendent Margaret Culbertson. Now, Asu lived at the home for 30 months. And during that time, she learned English. She learned how to cook and sew. She learned all about Christianity, too. And she eventually was baptized. And in 1881, she married uh, Quinn. And they moved back to San Diego, where he was living and he was supervising that expansion of the railroad from National City to San Bernardino. They lived in the area and uh, had 12 children, all of whom became quite successful and followed up on many of the different occupations that uh, Quinn held, including uh, continuing to support the Quinn Produce Building. Next slide. Here's a picture of the Quinn family. And as you can see, 12 beautiful children. 
and only one child did not survive to adulthood, and that was little McKinley. Next slide. Now, what was interesting about uh, Sue was she was asked by Walter Mellon to really clean up the gas lamp area and the Chinatown area. So she was entrusted to talk with the different people who lived in Chinatown to help them figure out how to clean up their homes and what, what particular shacks or hovels should be destroyed during this major cleanup starting in 1911. So she worked with the health department on this endeavor. Now, one of the areas that was in desperate need of being cleaned up were the compounds of brothels throughout the Stingery area of the red light district in this particular area of San Diego. And one of these areas was, was called the Wildcat Alley and it consisted of about 20 little cribs or stalls. And this is where prostitutes worked. Now there was a major cleanup uh, starting in 1912, next slide. And one of the women involved in this particular cleanup was Dr. Charlotte Baker. And she and her husband, Dr. Fred Baker, came to San Diego in 1888. Can you imagine this town of 16,000 people welcome two doctors to San Diego? And Dr. Charlotte Baker worked with the vice uh, Department of Law Enforcement to clean up this area. And her major concern was the elimination of venereal diseases in this area. But there was also a group of women, the Purity League from one of the local churches who also worked on this project. And they wanted to clean up this area before the big exposition in Balboa Park in 1915. So this whole area was to be cleaned up and purified before people arrived through the new Panama Canal uh, to disembark here at the foot of Broadway and go to Balboa Park to celebrate the new park here in our city. Now, Dr. Charlotte Baker was quite accomplished. She led the San Diego Women's Suffrage Association. She was president. She wanted women to vote. And she and her cadre of women would just pursue men who could vote to insist that they vote for women's suffrage. She also was quite the doctor. She delivered more than a thousand babies without the loss of a mother. And this was unheard of during that era when the second leading cause of death for childbearing women was childbirth or complications of pregnancy. She headed the San Diego County Medical Society, the first woman and one of the many first women ever to head up the medical society. She also headed the Civil Service Commission and was an honorary president of the YWCA. Thank you very much, Dr. Charlotte Baker, for your contributions to really saving San Diego. And she was a very staunch supporter of the um, Temperance Union also. Next slide. Now, other parts of Chinatown on Third Avenue include the new and the historic. So we have the CCBA sen Senior Garden, a beautiful residence for senior citizens that was built in 1999. Beautiful apartment building. And next to that particular building is the site where the Wu Chi Chang Company had resided. Now that particular store was open for almost a century. It, it expanded into three different locations 
and uh, provided Oriano goods and services and people could come and visit and hang out at this place and then the other locations throughout San Diego. Next slide. Other historic buildings include the Ying An Labor and Merchants Association, another beautiful building on Third Avenue. And we also were honored in this particular area to have created by our city, the Tom Hom Honorary Avenue. And what a delight it was to celebrate that opening of that, that area here on Third Avenue. Next slide. Other parts of Chinatown move on to Fourth Avenue and we have the Quinn Building and the Casa de Tomas edition. And those were both built by Tom Quinn, the son of uh, Quinn. And farther up the street was the uh, location of a Chinese herbalist that later became the Royal Pie Bakery. And upstairs was a notorious brothel that was finally shut down in 1935. Next slide. Perhaps one of the most gorgeous buildings in all of San Diego is a Horton Grand Hotel. And this was created by Dan Pearson. And he claims that he tore down uh, two buildings and reassemble them to create the Horton Grand Hotel. And that actually became one of the first sites of the Chinese Historical Museum and Tea Room. He set aside a room just for that purpose. And one of the uh, people who lived at the Brooklyn Hotel, the other end of this complex, was Wyatt Earp and his wife, Josie, even though they were not officially married. He refereed boxing matches and owned saloons, and they finally moved to Hollywood, where she urged the creation of a movie called Field Marshal, which was the story of Wyatt Earp. Next slide. Now, in addition to Josie Earp, there were three women who were considered infamous. They ran the three upscale brothels in the San Diego, Chinatown, well, primarily the gas lamp quarter. And one of those was Madame Ida Bailey's uh, Canary Cottage, which um, was at the end of this alley. Next slide. Another a madam was a madam, maybe Goldstein, and she had the turf club, and she did something unique. She hired the organist from the um, Lutheran church to provide music for the gentleman who came to the turf club. And the third madam was Madame Carrera, who had the Golden Poppy Hotel on Fifth Avenue. Next slide. Well, one of the most uh, beautiful buildings, and it's the oldest building in the gas lamp quarter, is the Davis Horton House or the Gas Lamp Museum. And this particular building came about primarily because of Maria de Jesus Estudillo. Next slide. Now, Maria was married to William Heath Davis, and he was a very successful developer in San Francisco, but she wanted to move from San Francisco back to San Diego. And her uncle had a home in Old Town and it was called Casa Estudillo, which is pictured here. So she wanted her husband to relocate to San Diego and he decided he thought it would be a great idea to develop a new part of San Diego. And he thought being near San Diego Bay was where the city should be. So he purchased land, he created, uh, he created um, a place for ships to land so they could uh, enjoy this new development. But unfortunately, 
even though he even brought some prefabricated houses from San Francisco to San Diego, the whole thing by 1853 had pretty much fizzled out. And uh, his development was called Rabbitsville because the rabbits took over again, or it was called Davis's Folly. Next slide. Now this shows you one of the pictures of one of those prefabricated houses. And as I mentioned, uh, downtown San Diego was, was really started by William Heath Davis in 1850. But then again, after that failed, it was again pursued by Alonzo Horton in 1867. Now he bought uh, land, about 800 acres, and he paid $265 for that whole parcel. And he divided everything into small lots, so there'd be a lot of corner lots. He gave or he sold a park area to the city for $10,000. And we'll talk a little bit more about the Horton Plaza Park a little bit later. Now his venture was very, very successful and it created a wonderful gas lamp order area and also uh, added to the Little Italy area and also Chinatown. Okay, next slide. Now the Davis Horton house was actually one of those prefabricated houses and the city found this house back in the early 1980s and they bought it and moved it to this location. So this Davis Horton house is the oldest house in the gas lamp quarter. And it has a most wonderful park next to it. And in that park are two statues of dogs. One is gas lamp bum. And he was sort of the mascot of the gas lamp quarter. And he would roam from bar to bar and attend all the celebrations. And our sister city, Edinburgh, had come some of the members of that organization had come to San Diego and they saw Gas Lamp Bomb and they wanted to add to that their own Edinburgh Bobby. So they sent this little statue of Bobby who's sitting on that bench. So we have Bum who's lying down and uh, Edinburgh Bobby sitting on the bench, welcoming people to this little park next to the Davis Horton House or Gas Lamp Museum. Next slide. Now I mentioned that there were women who helped people living in this area and they came out of the Helping Hands Home Mission. But one woman in particular, Anna Shepper, had her own prefabricated house and she actually ran the San Diego County Hospital, even though she had no medical training, but she offered beds to men in need for a dollar a night. And so she was the originator of the San Diego County Hospital. But here at the Helping Hands Home Mission at the Grand Pacific Hotel, was where Miss Johnson, who was a missionary, and Agnes God Dodson actually ran the first children's hospital in San Diego. And it, they operated this facility for just about 20 years, from 1900 to just about 1920, the first San Diego children's hospital. Next slide. Now, here we are in the Asian Pacific Thematic Historic District. And that's really divided into three distinct areas. One titled Chinatown, and we can see two buildings here that represent uh, that influence. And the next slide, and this shows Japantown and the Island Hotel and the Callan Hotel were both places where Japanese workers were welcome to live. Next slide. 
And then there was also the Filipino Quarter. And there was the Manila Cafe and also the Lincoln Hotel, both of which still exist. And uh, at the Lincoln Hotel is the Philippine Library and Museum. And this particular building during World War II was used to house Japanese Americans who were being sent to internment camps. And so they stayed at the Lincoln Hotel until they were ready to be shipped off. Next slide. The street farther is the old city hall. And this particular building was built in 1874, the first two floors of it. And in 1891, the next two floors were added. So this four story building and it's just beautiful. And this was the place where our city library was housed for many years. And this particular building took care of all of our offices for the city. And Lydia Knapp Horton, who came to San Diego in the 1860s with her husband, William Knapp, uh, was very concerned about the issue of why there was no building for a library. Next slide. Now she did pursue this dream of hers to have its own library here in San Diego. And she sent a letter to William Carnegie and asked him if there was a possibility he could build a library here in San Diego. And he said, of course, and he sent $50,000 for it and just encouraged her to have the city donate the land, which the city did. He also donated $10,000 for stacks for the books. And so this library was our public library for many years until it was torn down for another building. Next slide. Another activist in our community was Anna Gunn Marston. She came to San Diego in 1875 and, and all she could say was, wow, this place is barely a village. But during uh, her time here in San Diego, she met George Marston and they married and he started the development of his department stores beginning in 1881 but he was very dedicated to the Chinese community. And he was the one who donated the land for the Chinese mission school in its nearby dormitory. Next slide. Now, Fanny Keating wanted to honor her husband. So she built this beautiful building in the gas lamp quarter in 1890, and it still stands. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous building, and it housed the, the Croce restaurant, which was very popular during the 1980s, 1990s, and 2000s, until the Croce restaurant moved to another area. Next slide. Two other... Uh, buildings are important. Also, the Nesmith Greeley building, which was built by um, banker Nesmith, and his daughter was quite feisty, and she believed in women's right to vote. She also was concerned about uh, other issues related to women's rights, and she ended up marrying a gentleman who fought in the Civil War. Adolphus Greeley, and in 1881, he went on an expedition to the Arctic Circle, and he had 26 men with him on the ship. Well, they didn't return. So Henrietta pestered uh, William Todd Lincoln, who was Secretary of War, and said, you have to rescue my husband and the crew. Well, it wasn't something that was on the top of uh, Todd Lincoln's endeavors. And it wasn't until 1884 until a ship was finally sent to the Arctic Circle. And Adolphus Greeley and six of his crew members were still alive. They were returned to the US and he was given the Medal of Honor in 1935. And she continued her work, working for women's rights. 
Next slide. Two other outstanding women in the gas lamp corridor included Clara Shortridge Foles. And she uh, grew up in Iowa. She had three years of education and she became a school teacher at the age of 13. At the age of 15, she eloped and moved to Oregon with her husband. He was not a very good breadwinner and she ended up being a seamstress and provided for her family. He determined that maybe San Jose would be a better place for him to find a job. So they moved to San Jose. Unfortunately, he decided that um, he was still in love with his, the woman he met in Oregon. So he left Clara Shortridge Fultz with five children and he returned to Oregon. Well, Clara was quite the orator and she became known as Portia of the Pacific and she spoke out and managed to support her family through her speaking, but she loved the law and she started working for a judge and she applied to the Hastings School of Law and the Hastings School of Law said, sorry, no women allowed. Well, Clara was outraged, she sued Hastings School of Law and went to the California Supreme Court and she won. And the, the court said, Hastings, you must allow women. Well, this was in 1879. Well, Clara had passed the bar in 1878. So she wasn't about to go to law school. And she said, I would like to practice law. And the California law said, sorry, only white males can practice law in California. And she and her colleague, Laura DeForest Gordon, went to Sacramento and they created the Woman Attorneys Act, which was passed by both uh, the Senate and the Assembly. And the governor debated whether or not to sign it, but he signed it. So the law was changed that any person who passes the bar in California can practice law. She was our first California woman attorney and the first woman attorney here in San Diego. She had her office at the uh, Nesmith Greeley building and she also had the San Diego Bee. And then when she was 81 years old, she ran in the gubernatorial race, the primary as a Republican, she received a pretty substantial number of votes, but not enough to win the primary. Another dedicated woman was Helen Hunt Jackson, and she wrote the book Ramona. And her particular issue was the horrible way that African American, I'm sorry, that American natives were treated. And she was assigned by the Department of the Interior to come to Temecula and live there and try to figure out, well, how horrible was the treatment of the Temecula Indians and other Indians in that particular region? So she lived with uh, William and Ramona Wolf while she lived in Temecula and studied the ill treatment of Native Americans. Now, she was determined that the United States would be more receptive to cleaning up the way they were treating Native Americans. So she did write a book, which was not a bestseller. And then she thought, well, if I write a love story and include my beliefs about the ill treatment of Native Americans, maybe my message will get across. Well, she wrote the book Ramona and it was primarily based on, on Ramona Wolf, the woman where she lived with um, Ramona's husband and Ramona Wolf was half Indian. So this story, Ramona became a huge publishing success. Everybody was reading the book Ramona. Well, Ramona Wolf's husband died and she had to come to San Diego and she lived in the Gaslamp Quarter while she was dealing with how to deal with 
the courts in getting her share of her husband's estate. So that's the story of Ramona and how it impacted our particular area. And every summer, there is a special tribute to Ramona up in Hemet, special showing of the story of Ramona. Next slide. And finally, we come to the Horton Plaza Park at the end of the gas lamp quarter. And this was the park that Alonzo Horton sold to the city for $10,000. He and his wife lived on $100 a month until it was paid off. And then his wife had to go to work. Now, an, an exciting part of the Horton Plaza Park was that there was an open area for people to speak out and protest. Well, law enforcement was determined to shut it down. But in the meantime, Emma Goldman and her colleague came to San Diego and she was going to speak out in favor of the international workers of the world, the Wobblies. Well, she and uh, her companion were staying at the U.S. Grand Hotel. The head of our law enforcement came and spoke to Emma and said, it's too dangerous. We don't want you speaking at the park. We really don't. So she was encouraged to leave town. In the meantime, her boyfriend was picked up by vigilantes and driven to Oceanside where he was tortured and left stranded. Well, interestingly enough, they came back the following year and they were determined to have another protest. And again, the chief of police took them over to the train station and urged them to leave town. Well, we've now completed the walking tour and this, this little tour uh, virtually uh, of the gas lamp quarter and Chinatown. So we'll show the final slide and we'll just wrap up by talking briefly about those wonderful women leaders of social movements, including Dr. Charlotte Baker. Oh. She was in the forefront of women getting the right to vote and of cleaning up of the uh, stingery area of the gas lamp area. I also talked about Clara Shortridge Foltz, who was also pushing for women getting the right to vote. And she too thought it was important for women to volunteer to run for public office, and she ran as a gubernatorial candidate. Helen Hunt Jackson was determined to help the Native Americans in our country and stop their lands from being confiscated by our government. Lydia Knapp Horton was a believer in the women's club movement and also in the importance of a public library. And Anna, Anna Gunn Marston was very much a promoter of the rights for uh, different religious beliefs. And she was supporting missionaries working on behalf of various countries. And Emma Goldman was pushing for the Wobblies, the international workers of the world. Now we had staunch preservationist, Dorothy Hom in particular, Lily Chang, Sally Wong Avery, Cindy Quinn Su, and Asu uh, Quinn. There were also those wonderful social workers, Anna Shepper, who had the first San Diego County Hospital, Miss Johnson and Agnes Dodson, who also operated the first Children's Hospital here in San Diego. And then we had those wonderful superintendents of the Chinese Mission School, Mother Margaret Fanton and Mother Delia Reinbold. And there were also those infamous women, Madam Ida Bailey, Madam Mamie Goldstein, and Madam Correra. So it's been a wonderful experience exploring this 
area of architectural jewels and the stories of these phenomenal women of our community. Thank you for joining the tour. Well, and uh, I know I'm speaking for everyone here in saying that we were not disappointed. You did <laughs> just this wonderful job and I'm struck by a whole bunch of things. Uh, my uh, first question is, I wanna ask you how you uh, became involved in, uh, in studying uh, the women of the Gaslamp Quarter. Well, it began back in 2011. I, at that time, I was president of the League of Women Voters of San Diego, and we were hosting a conference for all League of Women Voters groups in California. And it was at the Gas Lamp Hotel. And I thought it would be important for the attendees for this conference to learn about our historic area. So I created this tour and I worked with a woman who was also a member of the league. And she went with me on the tour and we talked about what I should highlight, what I should downplay and what have you. Well, it turned out she was half Chinese and when she was a child, her father would put her on a bus and down to the Chinatown area, she would go to learn Chinese every Saturday. So she was a great help for me in identifying what buildings in the Chinatown area to include on this tour, primarily of the gas lamp quarter. And with the help of Lily Chang, we decided to expand that little tour and include more about the importance of Chinatown to our community. So that's how it all originated. That's cool. I have one other comment. And, and after that, I'm gonna ask Lily to uh, uh, offer her uh, her uh, comments and discuss. My, my comment is that history is written and taught by people in power. And, uh, and the minority views and minority representations are often completely omitted. And we just read in the newspaper a few weeks ago that the governor of Florida was uh, deleting black history from uh, advanced placement testing and, uh, and, uh, and history books are being altered, deleting this and deleting that. And basically much of what you talked about was probably news to a lot of the people watching. And, uh, and yet, so important. In fact, I think that Dr. Baker, in addition to her women's suffrage and medical stuff in San Diego, went through Escondido where I am and uh, she started an early clinic which uh, preceded the building of uh, Palomar Hospital which dates from about 1950. And so it's uh, fascinating how if it's not for people like you, uh, all this history is just unknown and it's so interesting. And, uh, and this was just one of our more wonderful uh, presentations. Uh, so I, I think everybody's probably agreeing with what I just said as well. Lily, uh, may, may we uh, have you uh, offer your uh, uh, thoughts? Don't, I'm sure you agree this is how wonderful this was and how important. Yes. Uh, thank you, Anne, and thank you, Bob. This is very important as we are celebrating women all over the world. The month of women and the 8th of March, International Women's Day. So uh, we all are celebrating women. We all have our mothers. So when you think about the mothers of Chinatown, you think about a Quinn's wife uh, having 12 children. You think about Tom Ham's family with 12 kids. You think about Tom Ham's wife, Dorothy Ham, with six children. You think about all the people who live in Chinatown. Today, it is important to tell their stories. I happen to have the privilege of serving as the chair of the San Diego City's Asian Pacific Historical Thematic District. 
And during that period, my mentor was Dorothy Hum. She not only coached me to understand about the city politics, she took me around the Chinatown area. She also was so involved with the rebuilding of the gas lamp district. She's yeah. not with us today here, but she is with us in spirit. I thank her. I thank all the women mentors who have taken the time to help other women. I also want to say that we thank the city of San Diego. The city of San Diego recognized the important district and had the wonderful, wonderful arrangement to name Tom Hum, the honorary avenue of Tom Hum Avenue. This is very important. I think yes. we want to never forget our history. I also want to say that by showing all the buildings that Anne Hoiberg did, I think it is wonderful for all of you who are in today present in this session to come to San Diego downtown again, to walk on the Third Avenue, Fourth Avenue, Fifth Avenue, Island Avenue, so that you can revisit our history. The purpose of the San Diego Chinese Historical Museum, the mission is to preserve, and this is indeed something we want to do. So I want to thank people to come in to see us. When you walk in that area, you should thank the city of San Diego for using special tiles for the streetscape. You should thank the city of San Diego, the whole community for planting Asian trees along the sides. You should also thank the city of San Diego for these Chinese lamps. These are very specific to our Asian Pacific thematic district. We are also going to paint the street with the Chinese history. So I look forward so much to seeing uh, the street being painted in front of the museum with a beautiful Chinese history. So all of this makes Chinatown San Diego Chinese Historical Museum a landmark you must come to visit. And I want to thank you all for enjoying today's session. And I'm giving it back to Dr. Bob. Thank you. Just I'm mute, please. I, I, just, I just unmuted myself. So uh, uh, I am uh, just fascinated by all of this. And uh, so if you're a minority, uh, uh, you're likely not gonna be represented in history books. If you're uh, a woman, probably not represented. If you're uh, a woman minority combined, uh, you're certainly not gonna be represented by and large. And if it's not for people like Anne Hoiberg, these stories would never be told. And uh, I, I just find it uh, just so interesting and uh, it's so captivating. Um, uh, what I'd like to do right now is I'd like to ask, I don't know if it's Elizabeth or Yudan who's checking the uh, chats and the questions from the uh, group, uh, but uh, we're more than happy to uh, address things if we could. Okay, so I you're the chat. You know, we can't hear you unless you speak right into that microphone. It's the yeah. funniest thing we figured that out. Okay. Can you hear me no, you've got to get right uh, in front. And so it's yeah. my, my yeah. computer is the same way. Mine is exactly the same way. All I have to do is turn my head 45 degrees and there's no sound. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So what I can, what I'm noticing, there are a lot of people who are expressing their gratitude for the presentation. <clears throat> um, Okay, I, I see there's, there were requests for the recording. Um, I don't see any hands raised. <clears throat> there's only one question that it looks like that's being posed and it says, how many businesses were in the original eight blocks of Chinatown? Oh, that's an interesting question. And uh, Anne, would you have any estimate? Uh, <clears throat> 
I would probably say maybe 20, but uh, that's really a, a major yes. There were several laundries in the area, several restaurants. Um, of course, the fishermen were very busy catching uh, fish for our community. And of course, there were so many uh, young Chinese members who were houseboys. Uh, in fact, I think Ah Quinn was a houseboy for George Marston. And so uh, there, was, there was just a lot of work going on by the Chinese settlers in this area. All of them were working hard to create a really outstanding Chinatown. Yeah. Um, George Marston was a very interesting gentleman, and I, I don't know if you could tell us any more about him. He's just remarkable. First of all, I want to point out to everyone that he has a beautiful mansion that is open to the public. You can Google it and find out the hours. It's in the it's on a street in the northwest corner of uh, Balboa Park, and um, uh, and uh, it's a it's a great tour, and it overlooks what's now for the freeway of 163. Back in the day, there was no freeway there, and um, and how Ann and his wife, uh, excuse me, uh, how Mrs. Uh, uh, how Mrs. Marston and uh, Mr. Marston became such liberal folks is uh, is fascinating. I'm always uh, interested in the uh in the breadth of human character and uh he uh was uh this man who was without prejudice over a hundred years ago and he was a friend to ah quinn he was a friend to the chinese community uh it's absolutely uh remarkable uh that some people were so ahead of their time. Uh, for, we're back to dr baker again who was uh not only the physician but also um, going from town to town, uh, promoting women's suffrage, uh, and um, and lamenting whether it ever would be passed. <laughs> uh, she did live. She did live to see the. Uh, I think the twentieth amendment uh, get passed. So it was yes, okay. she did. Yes, so she, she did. did. See that. Yes, so, uh, and do you, do you have any comments about Marston and his wife and? Uh, and uh, and these remarkable people, I, I just am amazed uh, uh, that people can rise to such heights. Well, it's interesting too about two of the Marston girls were very active in the Barrio Logan area and they created a neighborhood house there to meet some of the needs of the people living in Barrio Logan. So not only were Mr. and Mrs. Marston very active in the community, but at least two of their daughters were very active. Um, getting back to Dr. Charlotte Baker, she and her husband and family lived in Roseville in Point Loma. And I know the woman who now lives in the um, Baker home, and we've been talking about creating a landmark of Baker home. Uh, so we're pursuing that now to really honor Dr. Charlotte Baker and her husband, Dr. Fred Baker, and the tremendous work that they did for our community. Yeah, you know, uh, we'll all be looking forward to that. That would be uh, that would be wonderful. Uh, Lily. Brocade you, has a question or a comment. Brocade, unmute okay. yourself, please. Yeah. Thank, thank you for the wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, I, uh, you know, uh, we, I'm aware, uh, a lot of uh, aware that in the uh, period of history, I think it's early uh, uh, 20th century, that uh, many Chinatown in all over uh, the country, in many cities were burned people mass massacred and robbed. And I, it was amazing that seems to me, uh, San Diego, was a, Chinatown was able to escape the, that uh, fate and actually prosper. And so that, you know, testament to the really uh, nice people and welcoming environment in San Diego. But my question is, is there any 
the incident of discrimination or, or uh, persecution that you know uh, for, uh, in San Diego Chinatown against Chinese community? Well, of course, there were the exclusionary laws that were in effect. And this did have a tremendous impact on where the Chinese settlers could live. And unfortunately, this was um, a major problem. And I think uh, Tom Hom has a wonderful story about his mother who was determined to live in a special area of North Park. I believe that's correct. And uh, she went door to door and wanted to know if it was okay if she and her family moved into the area. And all the neighbors said, of course, please move in. And uh, she said she would offer tea in her home to anybody in the neighborhood. So this was a welcoming example of how uh, people in the community really welcomed uh, Chinese families. I don't know how prevalent that was, but it was certainly true in Tom Hom's case. Yeah, uh, Brocade, there were uh, endless uh, discriminatory areas in employment, in uh, uh, housing and the like. In fact, uh, when you listen to Anne's talk, she was pointing to Filipino town, Japan town, Chinatown, so even with the uh, restrictions in housing, it was sub-restricted uh, depending on your uh, ethnic origins. And uh, equal housing uh, where uh, people were able to uh, move to La Jolla uh, to, uh, because La Jolla was a very restricted area did not occur uh, until uh, 1960s when uh, Lyndon Johnson uh, signed the Equal Housing Act. Uh, so it's 1960s and immigration, uh, the Chinese Exclusion Act really uh, never ended uh, with the, uh, it did not really end with the uh, 1943 Magnuson Act, which did not allow new immigrants in the country. It, it only ended again in 1965 when the same Lyndon Johnson signed the Immigration Act of 1965, written by Emanuel Seller and co-sponsored by uh, Philip Hart uh, in the Senate. So uh, these are uh, remarkably new things. And so the answer is uh, there was uh, legalized and institutionalized discrimination before 1965. And Post 1965, it's not it's not institutionalized. Discrimination is more uh, informal and unwritten, but still with us today, and we're all fighting it. Yeah. Uh, but I'm glad you brought that up, Lily. I see yeah. you're reacting. Yeah. To that. Yes, I am reacting. It is true, Dr. Bob, that the Chinese Exclusion Act lasted more than 60 years. Every 10 years, the U.S. Congress would vote for the Chinese exclusion for fear that Chinese people, Chinamen mostly, would come over and take over the jobs of other people. The congressmen and women probably felt very threatened. So from 1882 all the way to 1943, that's number one. The second is we are going to have a talk in the very near future about the laundries in San Diego. Mm -hmm. Why were there so many laundries in San Diego? Of course, the answer is because they couldn't find other jobs. They were discriminated against. Mm -hmm. So please come to our museum. You will find a total map that shows all the Chinese laundries in San Diego. And of course, our talk will be wonderful. You can then understand the situation regarding exclusion. And then more recently, during the COVID, the San Diego Chinese Historical Museum, the physical buildings were being uh, vandalized. We still have to deal with that. So indeed, Dr. Bob, you mentioned about certain things, but there are 
there are racist remarks that can be made of people and of buildings, but there are also implicit feelings against certain groups of people. So what we try to do here is to find ways to make sure history is kept, history is being told, and that we do not ever want to repeat exclusion acts anywhere, not only in the United States, but anywhere in the world. That includes women, that includes indigenous people, that includes so-called minorities and people of color. So I think this, this is an, a mission that we all want to achieve. I know, Anne, you would agree with me, and I hope yes. you would comment also. Yeah, thank and, you. And, and all races and religions as well. So yes. what, the, what the Magnuson Act did, it did something. Uh, number one, the main thing it did was window dressing to appease uh, the Chinese government since they were our allies in World War II. That was the main purpose of the Magnuson Act. What it, it, in reality, it uh, allowed almost no one to immigrate into the United States because the 1924 uh, ultra restrictive immigration act was in place and again was not overturned until 1965. It did allow, however, the Chinese in this country to become naturalized citizens. And it did allow that and it overturned uh, the other uh, crazy ultra restrictive things against uh, Chinese, such as testifying in court and uh, uh, and uh, and uh, being allowed to go on vacation out of the country and return. So it did do something, but not much uh, until the 60s, believe it or not. Um, and do you have comments about that? Well, somebody did ask, uh, were there any efforts um, the Chinese mission schools to preserve Mandarin or Cantonese Chinese languages. I'm not sure what the answer is to that, but as I mentioned earlier, uh, one of my friends from the League of Women Voters did attend a Chinese language school at the CPBA building. Uh, in Chinatown during her childhood. So her parents, her father in particular, was determined that his daughter would learn Chinese. So those schools did exist. Uh, they, they, yeah, they do exist. They have been going on. There are many Chinese schools teaching Chinese uh, uh, Mandarin language, but also we have Chinese school that teaches Cantonese as well. Yes, actually the CCBA building on the second floor of the CCBA building was the classroom. And uh, we had a session uh, that was provided uh, by uh, one of the former students who went to that school that they were telling us about uh, the second school they had to go to. After their day school, they would go to the Chinese school in the afternoon and then they would learn. So you will hear more of it when John Lee Wong uh, comes to us to share his experience in, in a laundry, but also the Chinese school. Yes. Well, you know, we also don't want to forget uh, the San Diego Unified School District and uh, the uh, Barnard uh, Mandarin Magnet Elementary School, which uh, teaches Mandarin to uh, anyone who wants to uh, sign up for the uh, classes. So uh, there's a lot of uh, Mandarin speakers amongst the uh, kids at the Barnard Elementary School, uh, many of whom, uh, Pacific Beach, many of whom are not ethnically Chinese. Uh, Brocade, do you still have your hand up or is it a new question or uh, or what? I, I, have a, uh, I do have new question. I remember reading something about the war a group of fishermen, Chinese fishermen, uh, live in the uh, Colorado uh, uh, be island before, before, but now has only uh, some uh, stone or uh, kind of describing their ex existence. Does anybody have any uh, information about what happened to that Chinese fishing uh, uh, village? Well, uh, there were many, many, many fishing villages, and there is a uh, a plaque um, uh, and display, and I'm sure Lily Chang or Anne 
would tell us more about this in a second, but there's a plaque and a bench uh, and uh, beautiful stuff. Uh, and there's a little walking path and there were countless fishing villages and Ballast Point had one and the like. And these all died out. And uh, they, first of all, the Chinese fisher, fishermen uh, changed the California's uh, folks' appetite uh, going from uh, poultry and meat to uh, fish due to their efforts. And they all died out due to a combination of overfishing and also the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act, which resulted in a, in a progressively restricted uh, populations so that by around 1900, uh, there was very little left. Uh, Lily, can you uh, comment or Anne comment more about that uh, lovely memorial, which uh, I've, I've been to and I've gone to that just lovely walk to the Yacht Club. Uh, and uh, it's just a lot of fun. Yes. Well, uh, first of all, uh, San Diego Harbor and uh, in the in our the ocean near us, uh, there were many Chinese fishermen capturing mostly shrimp and abalone, yes. very important. They would dry the abalones, salted the shrimp, and then send them back to China. It was a very flourishing business. We have a model in the museum showing uh, the drawing of, of the abalones and the and the fish and shrimp and so on. Yes, so it was a very thriving industry. And the taste for abalone in China and now actually all over the world is very, uh, uh, is a very strong. So that's why I, I mentioned earlier that on the, in front of the Chinese Historical Museum, the streetscape we have chosen abalone, abalone shell as the symbol of the origin of our marine life, a marine career uh, for the Chinese fishermen in San Diego. So there are, of course, the footsteps of this, uh, these fishermen, uh, mostly in the current area of San Diego Chinatown, but also in the area near the convention center and so on and so forth. And Murray Lee's book does talk about the history. So if you want to walk down Mary, mem memory lane, I would suggest that you can purchase a book uh, to learn more. So Brocade, you ask wonderful questions. And also in Point Loma, uh, we have, uh, areas where the Chinese fishermen's uh, activities uh, were being recorded. Yeah, I, I want to point out that, Mur that Murray Lee's book, I think, has a map of where uh, many of the fishing villages were, which are just countless on Point Loma and around San Diego Harbor. And the uh, you can get it on uh, on uh, eBay uh, or on Amazon, but uh, the price is a lot higher than you can get if you buy it uh, and uh, visit to our museum. Right. Uh, uh, we sell it for about half the price you'll get uh, on Amazon. And it's a great book. Mary Lee did a wonderful job. Um, I see, uh, the, I, the see shells, I see, I see, oh, yes? Uh, the abalone shells are now becoming a collector's item. And at some stores where you can buy the abalone shell for decoration, it used to be that the abalone shells were used for ashtrays. But now it's become more important to collect these shells because they're beautiful. So that's another outcome of the abalone industry. Yeah. It, I see fact, Elizabeth staring at the questions. Uh, are there other questions, Elizabeth? Hmm. So I was looking to see. Yeah. There, were number, there were more comments than questions. Yeah. Anyway, I, I want to uh, add on some information for those who love abalones. The abalone shells are very precious, of course. They were very precious before also. The Chinese were able to figure out a way to take the shines, the beauty of abalone shells and make them and put them into beautiful, beautiful furniture and other items. But the 
the item that will be painted in front of the museum, that abalone will have nine holes. Nine is symbolic for longevity. Nine holes abalone is very precious. So I also want to invite you to come and see when it uh, opens up for the public to see. But this is a very good way, I think, uh, to probably end our session today with abalone, <laughs> nine whole shells in your imagination. Yeah. Lily, thank you so much for that. And uh, and again, thank you so much for this wonderful talk. It is now at the end. And I want to close by thanking everyone for uh, attending. And I certainly also want to remind everyone that next month we're going to have that great talk on uh, decoding uh, Chinese opera. And the month after is going to be the talk on Chinese laundries. Uh, and uh, you, Dan, I think is now trying to find that slide for upcoming talks. Good luck. Uh, and I also want to uh, ask the participants today uh, to stay on for a little bit of uh, debriefing. And oh, thank you, you did it. Uh, I wanna I ask uh, the participants to stay on for a little bit of debriefing and everyone else uh, you can sign off at this time. And uh, again, thank you so much for attending, okay? Yeah, may I just add one more? We have uh, people coming in from Europe, from uh, Asia, and from the continental USA. I want to thank all of you for joining us at different hours of the day and night. Thank you. And I don't know who's responsible for deleting folks, but whoever that is, delete away. And it's it's not, as... not deleting, it's uh, putting in waiting room. No one is removed. Oh, okay, sure, sure, sure. Put mm -hmm. in the waiting room, that's just fine. Uh, and as soon as we're ready, we'll have a bit of a chat. <laughs> See the number, it looks like 23 now, moving down. <laughs>